Um, and one of the things that I always liked about the Beats, and maybe some of this is marketing and some of it's utterly sincere, but that people like Ginsburg were always mapping their own past for you to see as well. You know, the young Ginsburg visiting William Carlos Williams and claiming to have these hallucinatory visitations from William Blake, um, and being able to trace his sexual lineage back to Whitman through only two other people, um, Neil Cassidy and then one other guy and then Whitman, so not even six degrees of Kevin Bacon to get back there. Um, and I think, too, in terms of the way that I just conceive of American poetry, the most clarifying thing I ever heard was from Ann Waldman um, just stating, and I'm going to paraphrase and get it a little bit wrong, but that um, there's Roy Whitman and there's Emily Dickinson, and that those give you the two poles. They're complementary, they're opposite, one's expansive, one contracts and introspects, the other encompasses everything. I think I made up a word, introspect's not a real word. But so these are the people, you know, through them, Creeley gave me Williams, which gave me Ford in time to Ray Armentrout and Graham Faust. Michael McClure introduced me to Robert Duncan um, and probably prepared me for everything from Philip Lamontia to Ronald Johnson to C.A. Conrad and Amy Catanzano. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I would say for right now is if I had never read Kerouac and gotten into the spontaneous prose, I might not have ever accepted Google sculpting or surrealism or John Cage or any of that. That was my lens into it. And, you know, would that be true? I don't know. Would I be reading Billy Collins and Robert Pinsky and thinking that they were not only the best but the only game in town? You know, that's a very real possibility, and I don't like to imagine that one. So. Um, and in terms of universities teaching the beats, I mean, that's uh, kind of spotty. And, you know, some of that can be attributed to snobbery, but also um, there are elements of it that are just practically impossible to teach. Like, you know, how do you teach to kiss the ass of the devil and eat shit? You know, or, you know, fuck his horny barbed cock. Or, you know, be a crazy dumb saint of the mind. Like, who can really teach that? Like, Naropa maybe? I don't know, but, you know, who else? So. That's enough for me. So Conrad did a whole series of videos, which you can find at, I think, jupiter88.ginsburg.blogspot.com. Um, and you, you said, Frank, that reading Ginsburg um, gave you permission to breathe. And I think you were talking specifically about the line. And I wondered if we could sort of start by talking about that, what that line is like. So I'll ask Frank to chime in, and then anyone else who wants to chime in specifically about the Ginsburg line. Sure, well, <clears throat> I guess where I was coming from with that was that I was corresponding at the time with Sid Corman, and um, you know, he had these very short, compact lines, and he was um, a proponent of that style, and I was, I was kind of writing in that style as well, and you know, at some point it felt a little precious to me, and that it was kind of like spanking the diamond, you know, to get that shine, and then you know, you had this sort of radical openness of, of the Allen Ginsberg line, and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of Allen Ginsberg work out there that people will say, you know, this oh that's terrible, or, but you know, it, it was it was part of his process to um, have that expansiveness, and even if it wasn't perfect, it was uh, so. In terms of permission, I think that's where I was uh, going with it. Um, yes. I see the same thing, and, and there's something about that push of the long line towards the public, so that when you place all these associations on top of each other, it might not be universal. People might not be able to follow, but it's that openness, that length of the line that is like inviting and allowing people in. And it also is not just telling it like it is, but telling it kind of like, like it should be. He's imagining a possible future world where it's like better. Um, my favorite quote is Ferlinghetti, the first time he heard Hal saying, I never saw the world like that before. And that's a really basic thing to say or to notice. But to even realize that something untrue or fictionalized could be a possible future, I mean, that's one of the great things the Beats and all avant-garde poetry does is imagine possible alternative futures. Do you think it's also about imagining a particular kind of public? Because I'm thinking of this line from Sunflower Sutra where Ginsburg, Ginsburg writes, we're not 
We're not our skin of grime. We're not our dread, bleak, dusty, imageless locomotive. We're all golden sunflowers inside. So there's this real, there's this incredible specificity, but there's also a universality. What do you guys think about that? Well, there's a term Ginsburg used, um, cosmic anti-fascism. And it was, and that kind of line speaks to that in the way that the consciousness of that sunflower is the resistance to, um, to what Ann Waldman calls the omnipresent mammon of the state, mm -hmm. being the insatiable greed of the false god. Would you be willing to say a little bit more about cosmic anti-fascism? Sure. <clears throat> um, <laughs> well, I mean, that's an important thing with Ginsburg and, you know, the radicalism and the tradition of, ra of radical politics mm -hmm. that Ann Waldman brings to us today, which will be the legacy of Amiri Baraka. Um, but also, you know, the beginnings of a, of a radical ecology of, of, you know, Ginsburg and Gary Snyder and McClure and uh, Diane DePrima and her school of healing arts. It's, it, there's a holistic approach to uh, the world through their work that, um, that has little separation between their lives and their uh, the product or their output of their work. Amiri Baraka, anti-Semite, truth teller, homophobe, hero, mm. question mark, question mark. Mm -hmm. So Baraka's legacy is variegated and complex. Um, and it sounds like the question is coming kind of out of the bigger question of legacy. Does anyone want to tackle this one? I think we're probably better prepared to answer, like, should he be considered a beat or not? I don't know if that's a, a fair way to tackle it instead of the other stuff. And that maybe some of those other concerns with Baraka are concerns that all of the beats um, are... Some of it comes out of the work, some of it comes out of... The people, biography, the, co yeah. the context. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and Barack breaks from the beats, and Barack is also associated with, you know, Frank O'Hara and other poets. So these categories, uh, but it's definitely the the intensity of the culture and everything is, is exploding in Barack, and he, he puts it in the work, and it's it's not pretty, and a lot of the things that you know in, in the culture aren't pretty, and so. There it is. It, it's the ugliness and the, the, the transcendent is trying to work together and at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. Great tension. We also have a portable mic. If anyone in the audience has a question or comment, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I know some of you brought artifacts with you. So if someone brought a poem, or, or we, we circulated some poems over email too before this event, but does someone have something they want to kind of bring to the table? I see lots of books in front of people. And a Frank's computer. Um, <laughs> so speaking of Amiri Baraka, um, this poem for me encapsulates the beats. And it's not from 60 years ago. It's like a little more than 60 days ago. Diane DePrima wrote the day after Amiri Baraka died. It's called For Amiri Baraka. Don't matter, was it your left foot went bad or your right don't matter your lungs or your heart. Don't matter if that mass on your liver was malignant or what's been wrong so long with your kidneys. Don't matter drugs or herbs or acupuncture or why you didn't go to those appointments. Don't matter how much you drank or if you drank. Don't matter if you did or you didn't take drugs, meaning meds, or take drugs, meaning drugs. What matters now, what matters and what's gonna matter a hundred, a thousand years, what matters when what we wrote, what we thought is lost. And don't kid yourself, Ginsburg, it's all of it gonna be lost. What matters, every place you read, every line you wrote, every dog-eared book or pamphlet or somebody's shelf, every skinny hopeful kid you grin that grin at while they said, they thought they could write. They thought they could fight. They knew for sure they could change the world. 
every human dream you heard or inspired after the book signing, after the reading, after one more unspeakable faculty dinner, after that <laughs> god-awful flight to the drive to the school. What matters? The memory of the poem in thousands of minds. That quantum of energy passed over, passed all the way over to the other, to thousands of others. What matters? Revolution. What matters? Revelation. What matters? The poem taking root in thousands of minds. Thanks, Frank. Um, can you tell us where we can find that poem, if we can? Sure, it's online. I think it was in the San Francisco Guardian. So why did you decide to organize an entire class around it? How do your students feel about it? What do you do with it? How do you teach the, all of the curse words and all of the asses and the shit? Talk a little bit about that. Lots of censorship. Um, no, so one of, one of the things that helps the course happen is that I'm not, f it's not a freely designed, it's part of Penn's Writing in the Disciplines program, so it's organized around a research text, so it's organized around a literary biography called American Scream by Jonah Raskin, so rather than organized around just reading the poem in our own sort of interpretations, we're basing our readings in a reading that is a literary biography. So Ginsburg is a homosexual, therefore Howell means this, or Ginsburg's mom was crazy, therefore this. And so that can be for many students a very reductionist reading, but it is a reading that Raskin is not the only one that, who does it. Many people do it. There are probably 20 literary biographies that, that do the same thing. Um, and it's, it's meant to offer one way of reading. Um, I think it's a way a lot of us read in high school the poem and the work and the life. Um, and then in just today in our class, we started talking about what we're talking about today, different ways, rethinking the beats, recasting, what do we want to add? Um, a woman in my class is um, reading about women and the beats, that great book by night. Um, ah. Yeah, so we're, we're getting into the stuff. Someone in our class is going to do a queer recovery of the beats, I think. Someone's writing about Buddhism. Um, so we're really getting at, I think, some of the, maybe the new work to be done, and that's the reason I decided to teach it, not to, to go over the old myths, but maybe to talk about them, and then we can talk about them with our parents and grandparents, and then maybe to do, to do new stuff. Great, and I just want to make a quick plug for Brenda Knight's fabulous book, yeah. Women of the Beat Generation, um, forward by Ann Waldman, um, is a, a much needed anthology to our understanding of this entire movement. So do your students, do they find Howell dated at all? Do they find it quaint? Like, what are their issues with it? Do you want to ask them? There are five yeah, of them Yeah, I would here. love to ask. I would Who wants to, to volunteer? I'll point to them or they will, they're brave. These are the brave ones. And, and I know we have a question on the phone, so we'll, we'll just hear from a couple of the students and then we'll hear from whoever's on the phone with Lily. So somebody has to raise John. their hand. Yeah, right here. <laughs> all right, what's your name? Uh, my name's John. Hi, John. Um, so the question was about, it, is, is the poem sort of dated to us, or how do we... Yeah, does it feel, does it feel dated? Does it feel current? No, I, I think it's very current. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poem that is, I think, absolutely applicable in any generation. It feels timeless to me. And, you know, what, one of the great things about the course is that, yes, you know, we base it off of one person's interpretation, but... From that, we can bring our own interpretations. You know, it was it was interesting to have the point of view of of say the Raskin text. But um, what was more interesting is that we could take that and and further our own interpretation. And for for me, it was something that very much resonated with me today, especially at the the point in time I was at my life as a college freshman. So it resonated especially with your with your life as a college freshman. Wow. Yeah, just sort of this. So like perched on the edge of possibility, embarking on. Yeah, but also just sort of at the same time, you know, getting to see the world around you and and almost saying, "Fuck this," you know. <laughs> it, it you know it, it was almost an empowering, you know, the the language that was used and. And, and the way they express it and... You don't and have to love your Ivy League university if you don't love it. Yes, now we, now we can hear you. Okay, yeah, it occurs to me, um, 
that um, having uh, taken a course with Al, not a surprise to learn actually, and I have in fact become a, a real believer in, in Walt Whitman and, and Dickinson as being the, the two key figures. But amusingly, it occurred to me, famously, Emily Dickinson said that she had not read Walt Whitman because she had heard that he was disgraceful. And it, it, it dawned on me that the concept of disgraceful may actually be, have more significance than one might, might originally think. And that is to say, is it in a sense uh, of something being not graceful, is there not something possibly about the works, not only of Walt Whitman, but of so many of the beasts that we're talking about, Allen Ginsberg Powell and, and several other examples, that part of the potency and part of the impact of this is that, in fact, it is a kind of dis disgraceful, the ungraceful, necessarily ungraceful way in which, in which the material has to be pre presented. And I'm thinking here also of, of Bob Dylan, who received uh, the, the, the Kennedy Center medal. And it, it occurred to me, he could only receive that medal after, after his impact. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I've got mixed feelings a bit about Bob Dylan, but he could only receive something like that after something has been watered down and the culture was ready to somehow accept this. And I really wonder whether or not the, the wonderful impact of beat writing, beat poetry, that made such a phenomenal impact, and I think still does, in a way makes that impact because there is something somehow uh, disgraceful about that. And it seemed interesting to me. And I, I wonder if anybody had any feelings about this. Thank you so much. I feel like you just you just did it. You just you just did the whole question. But I am going to ask Maria to respond because you've devoted so much of your life to talking about the importance of rebellion um, and what it means to rebel against culture. So what are your thoughts on what Jeffrey has to say about disgrace? <clears throat> I think it's, um, it's very interesting and I think it's exactly what I find beautiful about the beats in general. Coming from a punk rock background, um, having read very traditional poetry in high school, and then hearing the language of the beats felt as liberating as listening to punk for the first time. So the lack of grace is, is the best thing about it. What else? Who else has thoughts and about yet, disgrace? And you know, when you hear Ginsburg read the poem for the first time, like the very first reading of it, there's this vulnerability in his voice. Yes. There's a tenderness. There's a ten and, and so the, there's, there's the song, right? There's this, the, the, uh, the, of the repetition. So somehow inside of, of all of these churning disgraces, is a, cert a certain kind of new, a, a new limit of what grace can be, perhaps, you know, so like endless, endless sort of back and forth and, you know, tensions, but the, the, that, the, the accumulative uh, impact of the poem just becomes you know, tremendous, but those first vulnerable, tender readings are very moving to me. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the bare revelation of just that fight to stay human you know, it flies in the face of conventional grace. And, you know, in terms of the beats being dated, I mean, if you think about it, we're living under the same empire they did. And, you know, all you hear in the news now is Cold War, Cold War, Cold War. And there's still a war on women. So how irrelevant can it be, really? Thanks so much for that question, Jeffrey. Are you still there with us? Um, I, want, I was curious to hear you say a little bit about Whitman. Yes, Do you find Whitman disgraceful? I'm sorry? Do you find, do you find Whitman disgraceful? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I find it necessary. I mean, and, and that's, I think that's one of the points. In, in a way, you need to be disgraceful in order to sing, sing the word. I mean, sing the thought, sing the word. You, you need to be disgraceful. You, you, you need to be not discreet. Um, and you know, it was mentioned. Of, uh, it was mentioned was made of Billy Collins and, and Robert Tinsky and so many other poets. And um, technically sound as they may be, and interesting as many of them are, um, the notion the notion of singing, doing poetry in the big voice, uh, and the notion of a lack of discretion, and the the, the, the notion of being disgraceful again, I think, is a, such a key vital part of all of this, and I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, so this is from Jack Kerouac. It's uh, from Playboy magazine in 1959. It was the first time the Beat Generation was sort of coined. It's just interesting what he says at the end as we think about the legacy of women in the Beats. And yeah, 
The cool hipster today is your bearded laconic sage or schlerm before a hardly touched beer in a beatnik dive, whose speech is low and unfriendly, whose girls say nothing and wear black. I'm, I'm just going to sit here wearing black and not say anything else. <laughs>